So I'd like to point out today I'm going to walk you through the operation of the microscope, in this case the 3400. While this training shows some of the highlights of the operations needed, it does not constitute a full training. Before using this instrument, you must contact a member of USEF staff and arrange training prior to operating the microscope on your own. So welcome to the USEF user facility. My name is Paul Wallace and I'm a staff member here. Today I'd like to go over the operation of the 3400 SEM with variable pressure and electron dispersion spectroscopy for elemental analysis. The first step in getting a good SEM sample is proper mounting and proper coating of your sample and there are a few rules. First of all, your sample must fit inside the chamber. So if you're bringing something bigger than 50 millimeters tall, you've got to cut it into little pieces and we can help you with that. The second rule is it must be vacuum compatible. Electron microscopes use electrons which do not interact well with air. So if we work in atmosphere, the electrons never make it down to the sample. So that's why we evacuate the chamber. If your sample is outgassing or wet, you will foul the chamber and bad things will occur. So it's very important that your samples can handle vacuum. That's generally done by kept keeping them under vacuum overnight or in the platinum sputtering process in the prep lab. This microscope in particular is equipped with variable pressure, which means we can all go all the way from high vacuum up to 280 pascals, but sometimes works for moist samples, not wet samples like an ESEM. If you have any questions about working on samples that are not perfectly dry, please ask a staff member. Also, going along with being dry, your sample must be electrically conductive. If your sample takes the electrons all the way to the chuck and through the stage, you'll get nice beautiful images with secondary electrons. However, if there's an interruption in the electrical path from the sample to the stage, your sample will charge. You'll get a density of electrons on the sample, so there'll be a density of electrons, and when the electron beam comes in, that electron beam will be deflected by the existing electrons on the sample, which generally leads to poor images and all sorts of problems. This microscope, because it's variable pressure, can introduce atmospheric air at a low pressure, generally 280 pascal, and the feature of that is it's another way to dissipate charge. So again, if you have any questions about your sample, please check with me before operating the microscope. Samples typically used in operation on the 3400 are of all types and varieties, all the way from metals like the coins shown here, semiconductor processes such as the square of silicon, which is microfabricated with aluminum, all the way up to nature materials like the cicada, who can actually be imaged whole, and the eyes of a dragonfly that have been coated extensively in gold. Because this microscope is variable pressure, we can also work on glass surfaces without coating them, which is a unique advantage of this tool. However, in general practice, if you're working on a piece of glass, you want to have a conductive path to ground, and that's that little black strap on the flat samples that goes from the top surface, which in this case is ITO coated, over the side, back underneath, and to the bottom of the sample. In terms of mounting the sample, for routine work, we generally use what are called stubs. They're half an inch to one inch in diameter and have a pin on the back side, which fits into the microscope chamber. We use carbon tape or copper tape to make them conductive, and we coat them with platinum or carbon to make sure the top surface is conductive and appropriate for SEM. The pin stubs can then be transferred into the mounting hole, which is the four place holder on the copper base. And when working with electron microscopes, it's very important to match the height of all your samples on the stub. So in this case, we have a particularly tall sample and a particularly short sample. What generally happens in this geometry is you focus and move the beam up to work on the thick sample, forget, and then hit the microscope with the tall sample. So wherever possible, go ahead and be sure to use the same height of samples. As this is a vacuum technique, it's extremely important to be clean, have clean samples, and wear clean gloves because the oils on your fingers can foul the microscope and cause problems with the vacuum. The sample we're going to look at today is a piece of rock, I believe it is granite, embedded in epoxy and then mounted into the one inch holder. It also has a piece of plastic, which we'll see the function in a moment, and it's held onto a little pin. When working with the microscope, it's always important to know the working distance, which is the number indicated here. 
So you want to always be sure you understand the working distance and record that number. In this case, it looks like it's a little over five, where if you're working with the taller sample, you would say 24 is your working distance. This is a precaution that limits the possibility of damage when loading the microscope. The electron microscope is stored under vacuum so that the door won't open. To load your sample, the first thing you need to do is bring the sample chamber up to atmospheric pressure, and that's accomplished by pressing and holding the air button until you hear the microscope move. And then it will complete the automatic vent procedure, which takes a minute to two minutes, depending. So the first things you want to do when working with the microscope is sign into the paper logbook. This is your protection as it logs your name, your account number you wish to use, and the start and stop time. When you enter our user facility, the SCM computer should have Taipan enabled. This is our access control software, and you must use the username and password assigned by Yusuf to get the login. So first thing you want to do is log in to the microscope and that will open up a window and free the software for use. To start operation of the SEM, you want to start the software, which is labeled PCSEM in the upper corner, and that will start launching the software. The software has a provision for password. However, at this time, no password is used, so just go ahead and press OK to continue launching the software. At the same time, it's important to turn on the camera scope using the camera on off switch, which shows me a picture inside the chamber. We generally keep this camera off during idle, and we must turn it off for EDS. However, for loading the sample, it's a critical tool in determining how tall the sample is. We're looking from the side, and what we'll see is the sample actually rise, but hopefully not collide with the backscatter detector or the microscope as a whole. The next important step in loading the microscope is to correctly set the height of the sample. That's done first by measuring the height against the sample block and then recording that into the software setting. The size is the diameter and it's important to pick a diameter that's on the same scale as your sample. In this case we're working with a one inch sample, 25 millimeters. However, it's appropriate to choose something slightly larger at 51. The reason is if we choose a smaller number, we won't be able to move it to everywhere on the sample. If we choose a much, much larger number, like six inches, we won't be able to move very far from the center due to collisions with the side of the stage. So here I choose two inches, which is generally appropriate. If I'm working with a 12 placeholder, I'll choose three inches or 75 millimeters. The height is a selectable value, starting from standard, and you select the value that you measured previously. We are going to use the EDS today, so that's checked. And we can go ahead and press the OK button to go through. It repeats back the information, in this case 51 millimeters and a height of six, and allows you to go ahead and say OK. When the microscope reaches atmosphere, the door can be opened. So you grab the two handles from the side and pull gently towards you all the way to the hard stop, and that exposes the stage. The orientation of the stage is such that the top will become up, the bottom will become down and left and right. So you always want to grab your sample, put it in the holder, press down firmly, and have the top part of the sample pointing up. There is a safety protection here where your sample must clear this height here, otherwise it will collide with the pole piece. So when you're closing the door, carefully make sure that the sample slides beneath that piece. So to go back to vacuum, it's a good practice with electron microscopes to gently hold the door with one finger, press the evacuation button, which starts the pump down. And once you hear the pump start, go ahead and tug on the chamber door to make sure that the door is closed. On some microscopes, the door will roll back open. So it's always a good idea just to make sure that's sealed before you do anything else. Along the top bar of the microscope are several very useful buttons. At the far left, we have the on button and the off button. And the way electron microscopes are designed is the button to do next will be illuminated. The beam is off, so the off is not allowed. However, at this point, we could turn the beam on, which is why the on is illuminated. The accelerating voltage is shown. 
followed by the current. We have not turned the beam on. At this current time, the microscope is in the run condition where the image is updating. And when we take a capture and want to stop, we go ahead and press freeze. At the end of your capture, it's very important to go ahead and press run again to go back to live update. Otherwise, the image won't change. To set your beam parameters, go ahead and click on the accelerating voltage and the beam parameter tab will open. First, set your accelerating voltage and this number can change depending on what you're looking for. Today we're looking at a stone sample doing EDS, so we need a relatively high accelerating voltage and here I'll choose 20. However, 30 kV is appropriate for high resolution and numbers as low as 5 or even 2 kV are appropriate for low voltage imaging. So select the one that works best for you. Once you've selected the value, go ahead and press the on button, which will start turning the microscope on and conditioning the filament. When the accelerating voltage turns on, the image increases so that you can start to see what's on your sample. It's important to make sure that the filament is saturated. So to do that, we press the auto filament saturation at the midpoint following the second button in the training notes, and that will run the auto filament saturation routine. If we're not fully saturated, we don't have enough current, we have a weak signal. If we increase the current, we end up saturating and increasing the current further does nothing other than reduce the lifetime of the tip. So go ahead and run it in autofilament saturation. The filament and gun bias are typically automatically controlled and then we could set the probe current. The probe current again depends on the experiment you're wishing to accomp accomplish. In general, I start at 50% on the probe current. However, for high resolution, I'll go as low as 30 or even 0, or as high as 90 or even 100 for EDS, depending on the needs of the experiment. The working distance parameters down here do not reflect accurately on the actual position, so we're going to ignore those for a little while. So go ahead and select your probe current. In this case, we'll start with 50% as an initial value. So Going along the top of the screen, there's a number of menus in the taskbar that we'll make use of today. Right now, the image is on run. As you can see, it's updating. And during the capture, we'll move into the freeze, which stops the image and holds into the frozen state. It's very important before you make adjustments or move to get another sample that you again press run to turn back to live imaging. At this moment, we're in TV1, as indicated there. We can also go to TV2, which is a little slower. We can also go to fast, which is slower than TV, fast one and fast two, which gives a better image quality. However, there's a delay in the stage. And finally, we can go to slow, which is much slower. However, if you try to move the stage or change the focus during this operation, the image is not very usable. So for general purpose alignment, we use TV. There's an additional mode for red one, which is a box, and red two, which is a line for high resolution focusing. However, at this time, we'll just stay in TV because it's the fastest. The brightness and contrast are handled by the ABC button, the auto brightness and contrast control. If you click on that, the microscope will adjust the parameters. You can also adjust the parameters using the brightness and contrast knobs on the control in front of you which I'll talk about in a little while. The auto stigmation and focus control is not something I use or train, so we'll skip that for now. The alignment menu is a number of alignment features that we will cover later. The monitor F is another way of visualizing the signal and adjusting the brightness and contrast. The magnification is shown in the dialog bar. The 2560 is the capture button although additional resolutions are available to you through the little click dialog. There are two save buttons on top. We'll be using the first. There's the PCL command, which I do not train, and additional tools for operating the microscope. And the stop button for stopping program stage moves. So moving on to imaging a sample on the microscope, now it's loaded in the beam on, is to go ahead and turn the beam and we see an image. So to operate the microscope, there's a number of controls on the pads in front of you. The first is the stage XY controller to move around 
and you can lock that either to Y or to X. However, you're going to want to leave that in X, Y under normal operation. The magnification can zoom out and zoom back in, which is something I'm always using, followed by the focus. The small knob focuses quickly. So we can focus quickly with this smaller knob and a little bit slower with the big knob to make sure the microscope is in focus. The stigmation is important for adjusting the image at high magnification to make sure that the beam is a, a small spot as opposed to an ellipse. In most cases, it's sufficient to move the sample with X and Y. However, for specific situations, you might want to move the beam independently using the X and Y knob for the image shift. The brightness and contrast are in the upper quadrant and that allows you to change the black and white levels to get the best image. However, in most conditions we press the auto brightness and contrast control to let the microscope get close and then we can fine tune the image to what we need it to be. During the alignment process, the buttons here will illuminate to tell you what step of the alignment you are on. And the stigmation knobs become the multifunction knobs to adjust those during the alignment. Okay, now that they have the microscope turned on, we can start to see a little bit of the surface. The first thing we want to do is zoom out to get an idea of what we're looking at, and then use the focus knobs to adjust the focus. The smaller knob goes quickly, and the bigger knob goes slow. We can then move the stage in the XY direction to find out something we're interested in looking at. In this case, this object right here. Moving in, we can check the focus. So we have focused on this specimen and we can see that the working distance or the separation between the pole piece and the sample is given as 61 millimeters, which is quite far and out of view. To affect a stage move, what we want to do is we want to open up the panel, go to the stage, and look at the value of Z as currently entered. For safety, my recommendation is to enter the number, in this case moving to 20 millimeters, hover over the stop button, and press the enter or return key to affect that stage move. By having the stop button underneath your mouse, if something gets out of hand, you can immediately stop it before it collides. So what's happening here is the stage is moving up from the rest position all the way to a 20 millimeter separation. If the sample gets close to the pole piece or where the electrons are emitted, go ahead and press the stop button. So there we are at 20 millimeters. Refocusing, you can see the image is focused. Yeah, so the working distance is now 20, which is the same as what we set. For the experiment today, we're going to go a little higher. We're going to go to 15 millimeters to make use of the EDS detector. And now the stage moves up slightly. The next steps we want to do to optimize the microscope is to go in, find a region of interest with some texture, identify a spot, and zoom in. We turn down the contrast so we can see it clearly. And what we want to do is we want to change the focus to get the best focus possible. In this particular situation, you can see that the sample is streaking. It's streaking vertical. And if we move the focus knob, it streaks horizontal. That's a very important clue in the operation of electron microscope and it tells you that the stigmation is poor. So in the middle focus, halfway between streaking and streaking, we want to go to the stigmation knobs and align them to improve the image. That's worse, that's worse, halfway, that's worse, that's better, that's worse, than halfway. This process can be repeated a number of times until you get the sample nicely in focus. Right there. 
it's my preference to zoom in quite tight to do my focus and alignments and then zoom out for my image. When you do this, everything remains in focus and you get the sharpest pictures. To capture this image, we have three modes available to us. The first is to press the fast button so that you're on a fast scan and then press the 2560 button. This is capturing a frame averaged image where each frame is collected, added to the previous frame and then the result is displayed on the screen and the image shows up in the corner showing you that it's being saved. If your sample is drifting or moving and you do a frame average, you'll see that your image blurs or looks like it's out of focus. An alternative is to press the run to go back to live, press the slow, which is a much slower scan, and again press the capture. This is called line averaging, where we scan the line multiple times and then display the results for each line. If your sample is drifting, each line will be in focus, however the image will be distorted. So if you were expecting to have a circle, you might end up with an ellipse in the finished image. When the image finishes the line capture, the line averaging, it will again show up on the bottom as a saved image. In some situations, neither frame averaging or line averaging will be appropriate because your sample's moving. In that case, you can also press the run button, either the fast or the slow, and simply press the freeze button to save. That will capture an image. It is lower in quality, but if you have any stage movement, it captures a moment in time. And to save that, you want to go ahead and press the save dialog up above. To select your folder, go ahead and press select on the center of the screen. Navigate over to the T drive for transfer, the UA operators, find your folder, open your folder. In general, we ask that you have a second folder with the date, the date or the operation inside, and when you open that, you can save there. Type in your file name, and then you can again select your file name here. There's an additional area to provide more information, which is optional. The save button saves that image. To save the images below, you want to select them both with the shift key. Navigate to the save dialog, which indicates the folder. Give it a file name. In this case, the frame averaged. Indicate that it's saved. You can then give the name of the second folder, in this case line averaged, save, and there they are. To delete them with the shift key or pressing the button all, delete and you want to be sure to press all. If you say OK, it will ask you for every single folder. That's the save dialog. To get back to a live image, we can go ahead and press the run dialog which gives us the image. While this is a flat polished sample, it's not particularly interesting for secondary electrons, so we have some other modes of operations we can use to image it more appropriately. One of the modes available to us is in the image tab, which is to switch from the secondary electron, as shown here, to the backscattered electron auto brightness and contrast control to see how we did. So here's the image in secondary electron. There's some more information we can get about this sample and that's done by switching to other modes like backscatter and EDS. Looking at this sample, this is a flat polished sample of rock. It's not particularly interesting in the secondary electron imaging because there's very little contrast in the topography. There are some additional modes available on this microscope to enhance the contrast. This is a, a technique that works well. There are some additional modes to enhance the contrast using other techniques. In this case, I'm going to increase the signal 
and switch over to the backscatter detector. What you can clearly see here is there's a contrasting composition where the heavier materials are shown as white because they backscatter more effectively. The light materials or lighter materials are shown as dark because they have less backscatter electrons and in this case a speck of dust or a piece of carbon shows up as very dark. As we zoom out on this rock sample, we can start to see a number of different domains become apparent. This information was not included in the secondary electrons, so backscatter can be a very useful tool. Okay, now that we've imaged this sample in both secondary electrons and backscatter electrons, we can see that there is some difference, however it is faint at this time. This microscope is also equipped with another imaging mode called elemental dispersion or electron dispersion spectroscopy that allows us to determine the composition as a function of position on these samples. So to start the elemental analysis, go ahead and launch the NSS software. We'll ask you for where you hope to save your file. Navigate to your folder on the T drive under UA operators to the file under your name. Click on the new project, right click on the project, give it a new name. If more information is needed, you can, you can enter it in the comment section. Go ahead and say okay. The first dialog we want to use is the spectrum dialog, which shows the spectrum on top, the elemental analysis on the side, and then some of the statistics for the process. At this point, it's important to look at the accelerating voltage to make sure that matches the microscope that the magnification updates as you zoom in and out so there's a connection. The working distance is the same on the microscope and then these three values are some statistics about your signal rate. In this case 33,000 is fairly high and if we press the run arrow what we see is a big peak at zero. What that means is we forgot to turn off the camera scope so make sure to click the camera to the off position at which point you'll actually start to see the signal climb. To gather your image, go ahead and press the start button. That will start the accumulation. And the things you want to be looking for is the live time displayed over here and keep track of both the dead time, the signal rate, and the time constant. The operation of the microscope is such that the dead time starts at zero for no signal and goes up to 100 for completely overwhelmed. You get very few counts at zero and you also get very few counts at 100, so you want to be at the peak. Generally that's accepted to be between 40 and 50 percent to give you the peak signal for your dwell time or dead time. To change the dead time, you can either change the signal rate by modifying the configuration of the microscope or you can change the time constant. Your operator will show you how to change the microscope to increase the signal rate. In this case, our spectrum is finished. You can see several peaks at um, quantized energy levels consistent with the Bohr model of the electron. And we can see things like the K line of silicon at 2.7, which matches the table on the wall or the poster behind. When the accumulation finishes, you'll see the image displayed on the screen with some of the potential elements already labeled. To refine this, you can use a combination of clicking and dragging on the mouse wheel to go ahead and scale into each and every peak. If you click in the center, it will show you the cursor in red and then the potential elements outlined in blue. In this case, the microscope has selected silicon. If you click on the element, you can see the given peaks, in this case the silicon K line, and how it overlaps with the peak. To identify other elements, you can either click on the element, which will show you where the peak is. You can add them in, such as the case you thought you had phosphor sulfur. Move the cursor to the center of the element, and you'll see the potential candidates are underlined in blue. In this case, it's identifying the sample as silicon. You can see the peak in green, which overlaps nicely with the peak, indicating that is silicon. Likewise, you can go through the maps, explore the other elements present, 
and identify any small peaks. In this case, there's evidence of sodium in the sample. You can see the other candidate, magnesium, is off to the side. And if you think you have magnesium, you'd click there, change the magnesium to green, which would identify, or you can change it all the way to pink to auto label, or black to exclude, depending on what you know is in your sample. In this case, I'll leave magnesium on. Once you've stepped through all the elements analysis and are confident you have identified everything in your sample, you can look at the spectrum, identify the major elements, which are greater than 10%, the minor elements, which are less than 10%, and the trace elements, which are less than 1% in your sample. You can also press on the quantify button, move over to the quant results tab, which will show you the elemental composition. In this case, sodium is the dominant composition, where you have some other components like oxygen, and some of the elements like zinc are merely trace. In contrast, we might be interested in a particular spot. We can move to point and shoot, gather the grayscale image with the acquire image button, which shows the image. We can then choose if we want to start immediately or delay, in this case delay, and select multiple spots to analyze. When we turn off the delay and press run, we'll go ahead and automatically collect the spectra here at position one and again at position two. As we finish the analysis at position one and move to the analysis at position two, you can see that there's a substantial change in the elemental composition. To select a point for analysis, use the arrow tool. You can click on point one, do your quantitative analysis, display the results, move to point two, do the quantitative analysis. You can see that these points are quite different. For comparison, it's possible to overlap two spectrum to see how greatly they differ in the element composition gives you the elemental composition at points one and point two. However, this detector, currently running at 24,000 counts, is bright enough it's possible to do a spectrum at every pixel. That's accessed through the spectral imaging tab, followed by the grayscale acquire, which scans the whole image twice. And then it started with the black run arrow. What the microscope is doing is it's gathering a EDS spectra at every pixel, auto-identifying some of the elements present and displaying the results as a map. As you see the sample accumulate, you can see that the signal grows and then the maps of the elemental distributions updates automatically. When the time expires or you choose to end the scan, you can press the stop button and at the end of the scan, it will display the result. Because the spectrum is being dispersed over many pixels, it is much dimmer at a given pixel. In this case, for aluminum, there's only 44 counts at each given pixel. For scientific accuracy, we generally aim for 60 or greater counts per pixel before publication. So make sure you collect your spectrum for as long as necessary. In looking at the spectrum, we can see some differences, such as a concentration of iron and a concentration of potassium. In this case, there's some places where the concentration of potassium is different than that of iron, shown in red, and there's some areas where they overlap. That's due to the process of the analysis. We're only showing the counts as intensity at a given pixel, and what we actually want to do is we want to do some subtraction, both of the background or the continuum, and we also want to deconvolve these peaks where you have some overlap between the potassium and the silicon, you'll have an overlap in the signal. To do that, we can move to the processing tab, select the weight percent option, select your binning, and start the process by pressing the screen door. What this process does is it removes the background, it deconvolutes the peak spectra, and shows you an image that is much more cleanly filtered. In this case, the iron and the potassium overlap less, 
and you can see that there's one pixel over here which is also rich in titanium. To add colors you click on the box above the element to change the color you right click you can select a new color apply and that gives you the result showing a difference in distribution of the minerals in this rock. To generate a report you can press the word or the PowerPoint export buttons and what that will do is automatically output the image into a word file. The data analysis for EDS can be quite complex. Please approach or consult with a staff member if you have any questions concerning this operation. When you're done collecting your data we need to follow the shutdown procedure. The first thing to do when shutting down the microscope is to turn off the electron beam which will automatically start the filament cooling. Because the filament is hot, being used for all this time, my preference is to next do the home command, which lowers the stage to the home position. The time it takes for the sample to lower generally is sufficient for the tip to cool. Once the stage is in the home position, which can take a minute or so, go ahead and start the process of introducing air by pressing the air button. This will bring the chamber back up to atmospheric pressure and allow you to remove your sample. Before you leave, make sure to remove your sample, log off of Taipan using the log off button in the upper corner, and that will stop your appointment. Go ahead and record your time on the paper logbook to accurately reflect your start and stop time and any staff assistance that was used. Clean up your sample. Don't forget your data which is on the T drive which you can access through the service PC and enjoy your day.